welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, uh, tonight's going to be part two of a five-part series that I'm doing on a sutra called the Questions of Upali, um, or it's also sometimes called the Definitive Vinaya, the Sutra on Definitive Discipline. So we started this sutra last week. It is Sutra 24 in the Maharatnakuta collection. Um, and well, I'll just mention this. So we only did the beginning couple of pages of the sutra last time. And, you know, it was sort of a, a general introduction with a long list of bodhisattvas. And what happened was, is that the Buddha asked, who among you bodhisattvas in the Dharma ending age in the future, when the Dharma is going out of existence, who among you bodhisattvas can uphold the true Dharma? And then all of the bodhisattvas recited a line of verse saying how it was that they would defend or protect the Dharma in the future. Then we got to a little section that started talking about you know, sort of the nature of the bodhisattva. And I kind of spent most of last uh, last Sunday talking about this section, which is about how if, if there are people who are inclined towards nirvana, then the bodhisattva appears basically as a monk of the Hinayana and teaches about accessing nirvana. But if there's people who like to contemplate dependent origination, the more heavy philosophical stuff, well, then the bodhisattva appears as a pratekya bhutta. But we also heard that a bodhisattva could appear even as a Buddha. And so this was a section that was about the sort of powers of the bodhisattva to transform themselves to be appropriate to the student in that way. And of course, that's an aspect of upaya, skillful means. And then at the end of last week, the very last part that I read, and I'm going to read you the whole paragraph here. And by the way, if you have the book, I'm on the bottom of page 264. So the very last thing we heard was the Buddha tell Shariputra, and this whole first part, the Buddha has been speaking to Shariputra. And he says, Shariputra, a bodhisattva knows the various aspirations of sentient beings, and by preaching the Dharma to them accordingly, liberates them. A bodhisattva reveals true wisdom to ignorant people. A bodhisattva can produce all kinds of illusory splendors without affecting the Dharma Dhatu and cause sentient beings to move gradually towards the shore of Nirvana. So at the end of last week, Maria had a question about that line regarding without affecting the Dharma Dhatu. So the first thing I want to do is, as you know, there is a, an alternate translation of this sutra from Tibetan, and I'm going to read to you the exact same paragraph from the Tibetan, and then we're going to kind of dive into this. So the exact same line, but from the Tibetan reads, Shariputra, Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, demonstrate liberation to ordinary, deluded, childish beings by using various forms of knowledge that align with their inclinations and thus bring them to an understanding of the true dharma. And yet, they never waver from their bodhisattva nature. They display various types of illusions in order to cause beings to progressively reach the seat of awakening. So, 
some slight differences there, but the, of course, the general gist of the, of the paragraph is the same, but we'll notice that there's no mention of the Dharma dot two. Hi, Vicki. <laughs> there's no mention of the Dharma dot two. There is though the mention of never wavering from their bodhisattva nature. So I went looking, and if you'll remember from last week, I mentioned that um, this is a, a translation from the Chinese, but there's actually two other very old Chinese translations of this sutra. So I went back and I read the paragraph, the same paragraph in, in those editions, and all of them are a, a little different but all of the Chinese versions do mention the Dharma Dattu. But in my reading of it, in my kind of basic, you know, Chinese in that way, I wouldn't exactly translate it as without affecting the Dharma Dattu. The Chinese is about not being moved and that seems to be more in relationship to the Tibetan of never wavering. So now it would be maybe that the Bodhisattva never wavers from the Dharma dot two. And now, in order to make sense of all of this and to have fun, because we want to be thinking about interesting things tonight, I want to do a very quick definition of this idea of the dharma dot two it's an idea that comes up a lot in mahayana sutras it comes up a lot within the world of buddhism but it's not always very well defined and actually usually if you go looking for a definition of the dharma dot two they will usually just tell you that it is equivalent to ideas like the dharmakaya or emptiness or suchness. But if you don't know what those things mean, it's not a very helpful definition. And I don't, I wouldn't exactly equate the dharma dot to with those other ideas I just mentioned. So let's do just a very quick definition of the dharma dot to. So this word gets translated a lot of different ways. Realm of reality would be the probably the most standard English translation, realm of reality, realm of truth. Eh, there's a few others, but indeed the word dharma dhatu is a has two parts to it, the word dharma and this word dhatu. Let's start with the word dot two. So within the world of Indian philosophy, not just Buddhist philosophy, but just Indian thinking in general, there's the idea of a dot two. And a dot two is translated as a realm, a dimension, a sphere. Um, those are all I can think of right now. But it's sort of about, a datu is sort of a, I guess a dimension, a dimension of reality might be a way to think about it. But what's easier is that if you know, or you will recall, within the world of Indian philosophy, which is then becomes part of Buddhist philosophy, there is what is known as the triple realm or the three realms, the, the, tri, the tri dot two. So the three dot twos. And it's actually very important that you know about the three realms, the three dot twos, if you're going to understand what the Dharma dot two is. So the three realms, the three dot twos are the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. So the kama dot two, rupa dot two, and the arupa dot two. 
So those are the three realms, the three dimensions, or the three spheres of reality. And the basic idea, and this is a teaching that I, I love to teach about the three realms, because it's one of those ideas that it's so basic. It's such a basic idea that you rarely find it defined or spoken about in Buddhist sutras. It is just the triple realm. You know the triple realm. And if you don't know the triple realm, it's kind of really helpful to know. So the basic idea, just to put it very, very simply, is that we are talking about, quote, reality, which is to say what you think you are seeing out in front of you, <laughs> right? And the idea is, is that for most of us, what's the, the idea of what is out there, the idea of like reality or the world, we usually just think of reality or the world as the world, as reality. But meaning that we don't usually think that there's a lot to it. We certainly don't usually think that there's three dimensions to that reality out there. But in Indian philosophy, going back very far, there is the idea that right out in front of you is on one level, at a kind of a very surface level, is what would be known as the realm of desire or the, the kama datu. And the idea about the kama datu, it, it, is, it is the realm of desire. And the idea about desire is that it is, is about what you want. It's about what you're attracted to. Or it could also be about what you are averse to. So what you are not attracted to. Because the realm of desire is operating on this attraction aversion polarity, right? But if we stop and think about it for just a minute, what we realize is that my feeling about everything out there in the world, what I mean is, is that it, thinking that something is beautiful and therefore attractive, or thinking something is like ugly, and therefore not desirable, we can become confused in thinking that things like beauty, beauty and ugliness, we can become confused and think that they are out there. That like, things are just beautiful, or things are just ugly. And my eyes and my brain are just sensors. They're just sensors of the world. And so if there's something beautiful out there to be sensed, I'm just going to sense it, right? And that's where the, the Buddhists in specifically want to say, no, 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 no. What you find beautiful, what you are averse to, somebody else might find attractive or what you find beautiful, they might be averse to. And so the first realization is that the realm of desire is projected out onto the world. And therefore each of us is kind of moving through our own sphere or realm of desire because we are interpreting or seeing everything through the lens of our wants and our aversions, our attractions and our desires, all of that. But we can forget that we're doing that projecting. And again, we can just think that the world is just the world out there in that way. So the first thing is to realize is that there's a realm of desire, but it's actually not out there. It's in a sense, in essence, it's being projected onto. What is it being projected onto? Well, to make this simple, it's not as simple as all of this, but to make it simple, 
we are projecting our desires and our wants and our cravings and our aversions onto the realm of form. So in early Buddhism, not so much the later Mahayana Buddhism, but in earlier Buddhism, there is understood to be an elemental realm of form. And when I say elemental, I mean earth, water, fire, and air, the four elements. And there is a dimension of reality out there, which is the world in terms of its elemental operation. So when we're thinking about the realm of form, there is nothing in the realm of form to get worked up about. <laughs> there is nothing exciting about the realm of form because the realm of form is just shape, size. Is it moving? Is it not moving? Is it solid? Is it liquid? And that something is solid, that's not more desirable than being liquid. It's just different. So the idea is, is that the realm of form is this elemental realm of just matter and just kind of like really basic physics, the way in which the elements interact. But any kind of meaning or significance, and of course, aesthetics, beauty, all of that is a realm of desire that's being put upon a realm of pure form. And it's sometimes even called that, the realm of pure form. Pure because it doesn't have any desire associated with it. By the way, if you want to know technically, dhyanas, or being in a dhyanic realm, is to be in the realm of form. Technically, within the world of Buddhist meditation, if you're in a dhyana or a jhana, a jhanic state, you are supposedly technically in the realm of just form having transcended that projected realm of desire. And that's what makes the a dhyana a peaceful, quiet, contemplative space, because it's just the realm of form. But it's not over yet. There's one more realm that's even deeper or even more below all of that. And that is what is known as the formless realm. Now, there's different sort of aspects to the formless realm. One thing that I would like to mention to you is that as I just mentioned that dhyanas are in the realm of form, traditionally samadhis, those deeper concentrations, are in the formless realm. And that's what makes dhyanas and samadhis different is that one is the dhyanas are in the realm of form, samadhis are in the formless realm. Now, as I was just saying, there's sort of a number of aspects to the formless realm, but there is an entry point, an access point to the formless realm. And you gain access to the formless realm through space. So the realm of space is considered sort of the entry way into the formless realm. Now, space is an interesting concept in Buddhism. It's an interesting concept in Indian philosophy. Space, as I often like to point out, is not outer space. It's not black void of space. In fact, space isn't anything. It's formless, and therefore it doesn't have a color. To think of space as being black is you're, you're already going down the wrong path because you are ascribing a quality, a characteristic to space, but space isn't anything. So it can't have a quality. It can't have characteristics. It can't have a location. So space is this very subtle dimension of reality and i and it is a dimension of reality 
It's a dimension of all of this in front of you. But where's the space? Space is in between things. And as I often like to point out, say, regarding my hands here, the idea here is, is that the reason why you can even conceive of my two hands is because there's space between them. And the idea is, is that if there was no space between them, they would be occupying the same space and therefore they would be the same thing. So space is actually, for, for me personally, it's much better to think about space as a dimension of consciousness, not as a dimension of the physical world, because it is space that the mind uses to differentiate this from that. And again, if there were no space, everything would collapse into being the same thing. And so the mind effectively creates order out of chaos or creates form out of space by differentiating things. And so you have form and form, but between them is space. But here's the thing, and this is why I emphasize that it's better to think about space as a dimension of consciousness because, so like right here, I've got my fingers up, I got my hands up, I'm here. And the idea here is that there's a lot of space here. And in fact, depending upon what you're differentiating, it will change the amount of space. What I mean is, is that what if I'm, what if I suggest that you don't differentiate my fingers or my hands and you just think of me, you know, all of me. Now the, the space is going to be over here, but there's not going to be space between my hands because it's all been assumed or consumed in the oneness of Michael. But what if I then asked you, no, let's talk about my fingers. All of a sudden the mind creates, or it doesn't create space, but it frees up a lot of space in order to conceive of my individual fingers, which are now all separated from each other by space. My point is, is that you can sort of slip through the cracks of all the form and just enter the realm of infinite space, which is actually right here. But if you're differentiating me from this or doing any differentiating, then you're doing that based upon form and space. But there's a way to just abide in the space without addressing in a way the form. And if you could do that, and you do this, of course, like I was saying, you, you move into a dhyana first where there's just form. And then you can kind of slip through the cracks of form into that formless realm of infinite space, and then you'd be in a samadhi. And in a samadhi, a defining characteristic of a samadhi is unity, a feeling of oneness. And the idea is, is that therefore there's no differentiating happening in that realm of infinite space. It is just spaciousness. And that's considered a samadhi when there's no differentiating going on. Okay. So those are the three realms. In early Buddhism, they don't talk about the Dharma Dhatu. There's no mention particularly of a Dharma Dhatu. 
in the early form of Buddhism, what might be called the Hinayana, there's the realm of desire, which is utter delusion, utter confusion, utter desire, craving, wanting, suffering. So for the early Buddhist tradition, the realm of Kama, especially insofar as Kama, K-A-M-M-A, is like sexual desire. So insofar as the Kama Datu is associated with like sexual desire, it's a, it's a no-go for early Buddhism. What you really want to do is get into the realm of form in doing a dhyana or being in a dhyana. And ooh, if you could get into a formless realm, a samadhi, wow. <laughs> like, and I'm, I'm setting us up. I'm being funny because I want to set us up. But the idea here is, is that in early Buddhism, the realm of desire was terrible. Realm of form was pretty good, but woo, the formless realm was really where you wanted to be. In other words, there was a hierarchy to this. I'm telling you all of that because in order to understand what the Dharma Dhatu is, it's tempting to sort of, it's very tempting to want to place the Dharma Dhatu as like, even above the realm of space or something like that. But the Dharma Dhatu is actually more subtle than even that, like being beyond the realm of space. And what it is, is that in the Mahayana, they do this really interesting thing, which is they recognize that the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm, they are different states of mind, but the underlying principles, the underlying dharmas, the underlying kind of physics, this, or what I should be saying, the same physics, the same principles are underneath or are causing the operations of all three of those realms. And so the first thing I want to tell you about the Dharma Dhatu, the realm of dharmas, it's the realm of principles. And what that means is it's a, it's a realm of understanding why things are happening the way they're happening. It's about understanding the dharmic principles that are operative, that are at work. In other words, it's a dharma that grasping, clinging, and, and craving produce suffering. That's a dharma. That's a principle. It's a, it's a law. And the idea is, is that Yes, when one is craving or wanting, one is then therefore suffering, and that's a property or that's a that's a law. And if you are craving and wanting, you are, of course, then hanging out in the realm of desire by definition, because you're desiring, you're wanting. And so the idea is, is that there is a dharma, there's a principle that is dictating the fact that in the realm of desire, one suffers because of craving. But it's also a dharmic principle that if you don't crave and want and develop a certain degree of upeksha or relinquishment, then you would move into a dhyanic state where you could actually see the realm of pure form. But your ability to see the realm of pure form because you're not desiring, that's based on dharmic principles, that that is the case. And then if you are not differentiating form, it's a dharmic principle that you would then move into the realm of space or into a formless realm. So even though the manifestation or the appearance 
even though the appearance of being in the realm of desire is different than being in a, the realm of form, which is different than being in the formless realm, even though those are different, they're actually all three operating under the same dharmic principles. And therefore, you could have an understanding of the underlying dharmic principles. And if you are seeing the world in terms of its dharmic principles, you're in the dharma dhatu. And that's where it's tempting to think of the dharma dhatu as being like beyond the three realms of desire, form, and formlessness. But the dharma dhatu is actually right in the three realms. And ultimately what starts to happen in the Mahayana, and this is what's interesting about the Mahayana, it starts to say or recognize that to be in the realm of form versus the realm of desire, that's a, that's a discrimination. That's a comparison. That's problematic. And to elevate the realm of space or to elevate the formless realm as being like wonderful or, or whatever, sublime, and then comparing the formless realm as sublime to the realm of desire as like, that's more delusion, that's more confusion. And so the Bodhisattva path in the Mahayana they're not particularly interested in escaping the realm of desire and getting into the formless realm because they understand the formless realm is almost just as delusional as the realm of desire. It is much more kind of uh, suggested in that way that one abide in the Dharma dot two. Now, there's one more thing to say about the Dharma dot two, though, that I, that I want to say to drive the point home. So, and, and it's going to bring me around to back to the sutra. So one other aspect of the Dharma dot two, that's really interesting. So I always, for this one, I like to use this example. So th this is a good example. I think of the Dharma dot two. <laughs> so what I mean is, is this, if I show this to you and you see a roll of toilet paper, it's understandable. I get it. It's white. It has a certain shape to it. I, I understand. Now, the idea here is, is that you could just see this as a roll of toilet paper. But what you might not have known is that this is actually my very, very delicate, fancy scarf. And it's actually, it's really nice. It actually is embroidered. You can see it has these beautiful patterns on it here. And you know, it's, it's funny, I, I mentioned this one a lot, my scarf. And the thing about it is, is that you might think I'm being funny, unless you've ever gone camping and never and didn't bring enough clothes, but realized you had toilet paper. And at night, if you make a scarf of this, it's a scarf. It, it, it's not being funny. It's not being cute. It actually is functioning as a scarf. It looks like a scarf. So what happened to the roll of toilet paper? Was it ever a roll of toilet paper or was that just your realm of desire mind projecting onto the realm of form a function or a use the way that you would use it? I use this this way. I use it to stay warm. I use it as a scarf. So that kind of reveals that we might be in two different realms of desire in that, in that regard, right? But that's not actually what I wanted to point out. The first thing that I wanted to point out is that this is not inherently, absolutely a roll of toilet paper. It could just as easily be a scarf. In fact, it could be a lot of things in that way. 
So as now that we understand that this isn't inherently a roll of toilet paper, that is the realm of desire being projected out. Now that we've established that, let's return to the roll of toilet paper idea. So if you understand that this is not inherently a, toilet, a roll of toilet paper, but now might be being seen as a roll of toilet paper, let's explore that. What is being seen as a roll of toilet paper? The idea is, is that if you are seeing this as a roll of toilet paper, I can make some very um, confident assumptions about you. <laughs> Meaning about your anatomy and about your bathing habits and all of what my point is, is that you would only see this as a roll of toilet paper if you have a behind, if you go to the bathroom, if you defecate, if you use toilets, because what is a roll of toilet paper? It's what you use to clean up after you defecate. So what I'm getting at is, is that if you understand that this is not inherently a roll of toilet paper, but is being seen as one, then we can examine that dharma, the dharma of the roll of toilet paper, and we can begin to notice that a roll of toilet paper implies or infers bathrooms, behinds, feces, all of these other ideas. Because you cannot conceive of a roll of toilet paper without simultaneously conceiving of all those other ideas. Now, I don't want to belabor this point too long, but if you really started looking at a dharma, any dharma, I'm using this one, but you could use this one, you could use this one. But my point is, is that if you start looking at any dharma carefully, you begin to notice the network of concepts that are implied or assumed in that idea of that dharma. Like, like the way that cars, automobiles, assume roads, tires, driving, all of these ideas, even walking. Walking is included in the idea of a car because only people that in a way could be walking or in a way could be mobile other ways think of cars in that way. So what I'm getting at is that if you kind of start examining any Dharma carefully enough, you can begin to start to see the network of ideas and then ultimately the network of the totality of all ideas that are implied by any given Dharma, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how whatever. So at the end, what I wanna say is that the Dharma Dhatu is the realm in which every single Dharma is seen to be this nexus in intersection point of a network of the totality of all other dharmas. That's the Dharma dot two idea. It's a little different than the realm of space or the realm of form or the realm of desire. And again, all the operations of the realm of desire are understood by the Dharma dot two idea. All the functions of the four elements are understood via the Dharma Dhatu idea, and then even the role or realm of space and formlessness is now understood through the Dharma Dhatu, the interpenetrating network of all concepts. It, 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 there is one phrase for the Dharma Dhatu that I really like. 
there's a, a technical word. It's a, not a Buddhist term. It's actually an English word, but not everybody knows this word. It, the word is concatenation. And a concatenation is like when you, you know, like um, um, it's basically when you use a hyphen and you take this idea and this idea and put them together. And so it, it, a concatenation is just a combination of two ideas into one idea that includes both of those ideas. And it, again, it's usually hyphenated. Well, they call the Dharma Dhatu the concatenation of all events in the universe. That is a very, very long hyphenated <laughs> string of events that is called the world in that sense. Okay, so that's the Dharma Dhatu. Now, unfortunately, though, this sutra, when it says, and I'm coming back to our sutra, and when it says that a bodhisattva can produce all kinds of illusory splendors without affecting the Dharma Dhatu, I personally, and this is based on reading the other two Chinese versions, I wouldn't probably translated it as without affecting the Dharma Dhatu because the language actually seems to be about without moving through the Dharma Dhatu, without moving in the Dharma Dhatu. The, my point is, is that in the sutras where they talk about the Dharma Dhatu in more detail, they ultimately talk about the bodhisattva who understands the Dharma Dhatu and is in a way then abiding in that Dharma Dhatu. One of the aspects of that is that the bodhisattva doesn't need to move. They are already everywhere. <laughs> and if you understand the interpenetrating concatenation of all events in the universe, you can kind of begin to understand how it is that a bodhisattva that understands this Dharma Dhatu is already everywhere and therefore requires no movement in the Dharma Dhatu. So that was a very long, complicated kind of answer to Maria's inquiry about what does that line mean? About and again, it's complicated because in the Tibetan, they don't even mention the Dharma Dhatu. It doesn't even have anything to do with the Dharma Dhatu. So I think it's more, this paragraph is much more about the Bodhisattva's ability to perform miracles to teach sentient beings. That's the, the gist of that paragraph. Okay. Shall we continue? Let's get into this um, definitive vinaya, the definitive discipline. So that's what this sutra is called. And so I want to read, the, oh yeah, I want to focus on this next part, basically page 265. So the sutra reads like this. Furthermore, Shariputra, a lay bodhisattva in the Chinese, it's a bodhisattva who has not left home. So a lay bodhisattva who dwells in kindness and harmlessness, ahimsa, should practice two kinds of giving. What are the two? The first is the giving of dharma, and the second is the giving of material possessions. Food, medicine, bedding, shelter things like that. So that's if you, that's for all you householder bodhisattvas out there. <laughs> the recommendation is two kinds of giving, giving dharma, giving wisdom, and giving necessities. A bodhisattva who has left the household life should practice four kinds of giving. What are those four? the giving of pens with which to copy sutras, 
the giving of ink for your pens, the giving of sutras, and the giving of instruction on the Dharma in those sutras. So those are those four. Pens and ink, sutras and instruction. And now, a bodhisattva who has achieved the patient realization of the birthlessness of all dharmas, or the non-arising of all dharmas, they should always be ready to give in three ways. What are the three? To give their throne, to give their spouse and children, and to give their head, eyes, and limbs. To give thus is great, most wonderful giving. So I, met, I think I started mentioning this last week, but it was about this language about a certain level bodhisattva, a very high level bodhisattva, and a, a, a willingness to give up even their own head, their eyes, and their limbs. I wanted to kind of, last week, I think I made it a point to mention, even Shariputra is blown away that a bodhisattva could do that. So my point is, is that if, if you hear about a bodhisattva being able to even give away their own body and limbs and all of that, and if you're like, whoa, like, I'm not really ready to do that, I just want you to know that we, we know that the Dharma, the Buddha, we know. It's like this is a very, very high level bodhisattva, the patient realization of the birthlessness of all phenomena. It's a very high level bodhisattva. My suggestion is to always sort of examine any reactions that we might have to even hearing about the suggestion that we might give away our limbs. So my point is, is that when we hear a sutra talk about a bodhisattva willing, willingly giving up their own body, rather than looking at that as a suggestion for you, Rather, I would suggest thinking about looking at your reaction to hearing about that and looking at your own attachments in that way. And again, not to like encourage you to relinquish everything because even the authors of this translation, their footnote to this section about giving away their heads and their eyes and all of that, the footnote is about how in other sutras, they talk about how this could be dangerous for low-level bodhisattvas. And I think it's because, you know, we just sort of need to appreciate the sentiment of giving away body, head, and limbs. And as I mentioned last week, you know, Buddhism has always been encouraging us to release attachment to the body <laughs> all the time. And so the idea of a bodhisattva willingly giving their head, it might be a very poetic way of talking about relinquishing attachment to the body. Just a suggestion. Okay. Okay, so those are three levels of bodhisattvahood. We've got lay bodhisattvas, household bodhisattvas, and then patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all dharmas, bodhisattva. And then, once again, Shariputra is very impressed by these upper-level bodhisattvas that can give so magnanimously. And so Shariputra asks, World Honored One, aren't these bodhisattvas afraid of desire, hatred, and ignorance? So... I'm sure you know, but just to be clear, those are the three kleshas, the three afflictions, known as the three poisons. Here, they're translating them as desire, hatred, and ignorance. But I often like to point out that 
raga, dvesha, and moha, those three poisons, the three, those three, raga is, it's normally translated as desire, craving, and all of that, but it's kind of nice or important to know that the three poisons, the first, raga, is it's about attraction, like being attracted versus divisha, which is aversion. And attraction and aversion are two motions or movements of the body towards or away from. I'm attracted and therefore I'm my gaze is towards it. My movement is towards it. My hands are moving towards it. So attraction is this way. Aversion is moving away, is this kind of like, no thanks. <laughs> now, as I like to point out, though, attraction turns into desire and craving. But the, the, the initial root, and by the way, the Buddha calls these also the three roots. So as a root cause, it's actually just about the attraction. But again, if it goes unchecked, it turns into these more visceral feelings of craving and desire. Same thing with aversion. If aversion goes unexamined, it can turn into hatred, ill will. I'm bitter at that thing. I hate that thing. And again, the emotions can get very visceral. But the initial klesha is about, no thanks, <laughs> be over here. Same with the third, moha. It's translated as ignorance, but avidya, avidya is ignorance. Moha is confusion. Moha is like that, you just woke up and you're kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? Like, where am I? What is this? It's like very confused. But confusion, if it goes unchecked, it can turn into ignorance. Ignorance is when you think you're right and you're not. Confusion, you don't, you don't think you're right. You, you're like, whoa, where am I? What's going on? I don't have any opinions on what's going on, but I'd like to know I'm confused. But that confusion can turn into this like adamant, I know everything kind of ignorance state in that way. So I'm going to probably stick to the language here of greed, hatred, and ignorance. But I want you to know that my feeling about the three poisons is that they are more low level emotions that turn into the more visceral emotions. All right. But let's read this section because this is really what I wanted to talk about. So this is really what this sutra has to offer. Like what I'm about to read is the like the nature of this sutra. So when Shariputra says, wow, world honor one, aren't these bodhisattvas afraid of the three poisons? The Buddha answers and says, Shariputra, all bodhisattvas should guard against two breaches or transgressions of discipline. What are the two? First is to break the discipline out of hatred. The second is to break the discipline out of ignorance. Both of those are grave breaches of the precepts or breaches of discipline. What about desire, you might ask? What's up with that one? Well, Shariputra, if a breach of discipline is committed out of desire, it is a fine, subtle fault, but it's hard to eliminate. If a breach of discipline is made out of hatred, it is a gross, serious fault, but it's easy to eliminate. If a breach of discipline is out of ignorance, 
Ooh, boy. It's a very grave, deep-seated fault and very hard to eliminate. Why? Desire, attraction, is the seed of all kinds of existence. It causes one to be involved in samsara endlessly. For this reason, it is fine and subtle, but hard to sever. One who breaks the precepts out of hatred will fall to the miserable planes of existence, but they may quickly get rid of that hatred. One who breaks the precepts out of ignorance will fall into the eight great hells and have great difficulty in being released from ignorance. Okay, let's talk. I just want to pause on that really quickly. So this is a kind of analysis of discipline that we don't really hear about in other sutras or in the Pali suttas in that way. The precepts are the precepts. Don't break them. <laughs> Follow them. It's like pretty straightforward. But this kind of um, analysis by the Buddha of breaking precepts and this idea of like, well, if you break a precepts out of desire, that's not as bad as if you break it out of hatred or you break it out of ignorance. So I want us to be very, very aware. And this is also going to, it's going to um, come up in the sutra later on. So I'm kind of just giving you a heads up. What the Buddha is describing here, this is all advice or analysis for bodhisattvas. And I say that because if you remember, not last week, but the sutra that I was doing prior to this one, we spent many, many, many weeks on the Upaya Sutra. If you remember, if you were here for that sutra, in that sutra, it was talk, it spoke about how the main precept, the main rule for bodhisattvas is being compassionate, being kind. It's number one. There's a great line where the uh, Shariputra, I think it's Shariputra, but one of the monks asks, what, what is a, a breach of discipline? What is it to break a precept for a bodhisattva? And the Buddha says, to not have compassion. That's to break the precepts. And so that whole sutra that we did about Upaya it was about how because the bodhisattva is leading with compassion, that every single action, mental, verbal, and physical, is all coming from a point of compassion. What that means, this is what we learned from that sutra, what that means is, is that a bodhisattva could appear to break a precept, but because their intention was entirely to benefit others and entirely out of compassion for others, it's not a transgression because they're leading with compassion. This sutra is kind, the reason why I chose it is it's kind of following that same vein by re, not reinterpreting, but reanalyzing the adherence of precepts and the adherence to the discipline and kind of saying that bodhisattvas adhere to discipline a little bit differently. And so if you're on the bodhisattva path, you, you should know that to break a precept out of ignorance or hatred is way worse than to break a precept out of desire. So any questions, comments, answers, ideas about that main kind of idea tonight? Cool. So just a quick, um, I want to I want to mention this really quickly, just because I think it's very funny. So there was reference here to if you break up, <clears throat> excuse me, if a bodhisattva breaks a precept out of ignorance, 
that they'll fall into these eight great hells. So these eight great hell realms are, you know, they describe them in detail, but I want to share with you one, and it has to do with this idea of ignorance. So you fall into these hell realms out of ignorance. And I want to give you an example of one of these hell realms. And I want to share this with you because I know that when, you know, people have this idea that Buddhism is either atheistic or they don't believe in gods and hells and heavens and all of that. And they're always a little disappointed when they hear about the hell realms. But I want to share with you, this is one of those eight great hell realms. This is what it's like to be born in one of those eight great hell realms. They say that there's this hell realm in which there is this giant iron pillar that is so hot. It's like, it's incredibly hot, this pillar. And beings that have committed transgressions out of ignorance are reborn in that hell realm, and they are born, reborn immediately in front of this giant pillar, and then they have the uncontrollable desire to hug it, and they go, ah, and they burn up only to be reborn in that exact same hell realm in front of the exact same pillar. And as soon as they're re reborn, they see the pillar and they go and they grab it and they go and they're reborn again. And it's why it's so hard to get out of this hell realm because you're not there for more than a second before you're being reborn again. But I want you to think about that as a metaphor for really bad behavior and just going back again and again and again. My feeling is, is that if you look into these hell realms, they're speaking metaphorically about life <laughs> and living a life in a hellish way versus living life in a heavenly way. So just wanted to share that. All right, so let's keep going. So the next section about this, still going with the way the Bodhisattva deals with discipline, it says, furthermore, Shariputra, if a Bodhisattva has committed a parajika offense, the, the four worst offenses as a monastic, they should earnestly and sincerely confess their misdeed to 10 pure bhikshus, monks. If a bodhisattva has committed a samkavesha, vishesha offense, not quite as bad as the parajikas, then that bodhisattva should earnestly confess their misdeeds to five pure monks. If a bodhisattva is affected by passion for another, male or female, depending on your inclinations, or is attracted because they have exchanged glances with someone, then that bodhisattva should earnestly confess their misdeed to one or two pure monks. Shariputra. If a bodhisattva has committed one of the five grave offenses, which is killing your mother, your father, a monk, a Buddha, and maybe a holy person or something, but patricide, matricide, the really bad offenses. So if a bodhisattva has committed one of the five grave offenses, a parajika, one of those four monastic offenses, or a samkha vashesha offense, or they've done harm to stupas or monks, or they've committed some other crime, they should sincerely repent in solitude day and night before the 35 buddhas, saying, and yeah, let me read this real quick. 
I'm actually, I'm going to switch over to the Tibetan version because they have the actual names of the Buddhas, not the translations from Chinese, which sound a little weird. Um, and yeah, let me read this first. Well, actually, no, I want to say a few things about confession and what's about to happen. And if we don't quite get to it, that's fine. We'll I'll read them next week. But so a thing about confession, I know that some of you, when we hear this, our Catholic alarm bells might go off and it's like confession, ding, 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 ding. I was trying to get away from this crap. Ding, ding, ding. I came to Buddhism because I didn't want any of this. Ding, ding, ding. So we need to understand something. As far as I can tell, as far as my research as a, as a student of religion, as you all know, that was like my graduate school training. It was all study of religion stuff. So not just Buddhism. As far as I know, as far as I can tell historically, the Buddha invented confession. And what I mean by that is that it is a very, very old part of Buddhism. In fact, the oldest things, texts, information that we have of Buddhism is not the sutras. The oldest information we have is about the Vinaya, about the monastic code, and actually how to do things like confession. So if you don't know this, the, the Buddha created a system in which on the full moon and the new moon, so twice a month, all of the monastics, male and female, would get together, but not together together, but all the, the female, the nuns would get together, all the monks would get together. And on the new moon and the full moon, they shave their heads clean. And in fact, in the oldest Buddhist tradition, they shaved all their hair. Uh, uh, not everybody knows this about Buddhism, but in the original Vinaya, it was eyebrows, pubic hair, everything. So twice a month on the new and full moon, you would shave all your bodily hair. And then the Sangha would get together and they would recite the Pratimoksha, the list of all the monastic rules. And then has anybody broken the rules? And it was at that time that a monk or a nun could step forward and confess and say, I, I broke rule number whatever. Now, if you break a parajika, which are the prohibitions against killing, stealing, sexuality, if you're a monastic, and claiming to have supernatural powers, <laughs> those four parajika offenses actually get you excommunicated they traditionally get you removed from the organization altogether. There's 13 sam, the samha, samgha vashesha offenses that also, they get you uh, like a timeout. You have to remove yourself from the sangha for a little while before you get to come back. But all the other lesser offenses, they are not, exactly punished, but they need to be confessed. And I just want to mention this, but if you don't know about all of the work that's being done in the modern world around, um, I guess they're kind of called these truth and reconciliation councils, and it's based on the idea of restorative justice, but it's a whole movement that started in South Africa after apartheid, but it also happened in Rwanda after the genocide. And what it was, or what it is, what restorative justice is, it's about the importance of those who have committed wrongdoing to acknowledge that they have committed wrongdoing. It's not about punishing. It's about truth. 
it's about the it's about voicing the truth and being honest about it and so it's a whole other way of looking at 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 justice and all of that and i just want you to know that it's a big thing nowadays but the world of buddhism like the buddhist monastic organization was kind of the original restorative justice form because that's what it was all about was about the absolute importance of confessing a transgression that forget punishment forget all of that the most important thing is that a person acknowledge that they've done it so what i'm getting at is is that confession has always been a part of buddhism and if i need to remind you this is we're going back 500 bc so way before jesus and the gang and all of that ever even showed up so it's probably also coming from a more of a historian's point of view it's probably more likely that the catholics got confession from the buddhists than the other way around and i know that that's like whoa wait what but it does seem that a lot of aspects of Catholicism, from the rosary to confessions to even a certain degree, the, 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 the garb, the uniforms, a lot of it seems to come from Catholic interactions with Japanese Buddhists way back in the day. So... I'm just saying that the the true the real story or history of confession still needs to be written in that way because the practice goes way back in the world of Buddhism. So I say that to I guess build us up for next week where I want to dive a little deeper into these 35 Buddhas of confession and probably yeah we'll start there next week and we'll kind of read this little well it's basically like a little ritual it's a little confession purification ritual in this sutra. So, um, yeah, let's save all that for next week. Yeah, any last minute questions, comments, answers, or ideas about anything that came up? Yeah, Maria. Oh, we're working on it, Maria. We're coming, we're coming. Where did you go? Where'd you go? Oh, there you go. We're coming. Jenny, Jenny's got it. She's on it. She's on it. <laughs> there it is. Okay. All right. So um, this goes all the way back to space, but in my continuing effort to get my mind around space, so to speak, um, I just had a quick um, metaphor. So thinking of like positive negative, would it be appropriate to think of the war, the realm of form or form sort of playing against the background of space and sort of like when you get into the formless realm, you kind of see past all the noise of form to the nothing that sort of between and behind and all around. Um, so, yeah, that's my question. Um, it's tricky. I would suggest possibly thinking about it this way. So you can think about, as an, as an analogy, you can think about Space as the canvas and form as all the paints and the colors and the forms with one, ex with one caveat. The canvas arises as you're painting. So there's no canvas there beforehand that you're painting on but the canvas arises as soon as you start painting. So how does that play out when you're contemplating the formless realm? 
it has to do with what I was saying or what I was trying to get at, which is that what is space and what is form is up to you. Ah, I, I always use this example. So I like to use this example because if you're seeing the two faces, that requires space. But if you're seeing the black kind of goblet in the middle, that requires space. But wait a minute, which is space? The white or the black? It's up to you. And you could see the faces, you could see the glass, or it's all space. And I know that's tricky because the mind is like, no, no, no. I can hang with this being space or I can hang with that being space, but how can I hang with both the black and the white being space? And that's where you have to notice that there's a tension of form that is then relying on space. And you can release the tension around the form and just slip into infinite vast space. Vast spacious awareness is what they call it. Right, because the mind is creating the form as well. And therefore the space, but coterminously with right. the decision on what is form. Kind of let the form fade out. Bingo. And Right. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, did you have a question? Yep. Eric. Oh. Thank you. So in the origin of the confession practice, did they also use the multiple 35 Buddhas or it was just before the one Buddha or before the Sangha? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know what it is or was originally. All my experiences, it was to the triple gem, to the mm -hmm. Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Those were the confessing agents, if you will, that are being replaced by the 35 Buddhas in this sutra. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right, everybody. That'll conclude this session, and we're just getting started on the, the discipline and all of that. Noe, did you have a question? Okay. All right, so we will pick back up next week. Thanks, everybody, for being here.